I'm Eric, the Travel Guy. Fantastic experiences await you beyond your backyard. So join me for the next 30 minutes as we explore and learn more about Colonial Williamsburg. My name is Eric Hastings. Yeah, that's me. And for as long as I can remember, I've always loved to travel. And I still do today. Airlines, hotels, cruises, new places, delicious food, I love all of it. And that's why I've been traveling the world professionally for more than a decade. But what troubles me these days is that Americans are leaving paid vacation time on the table each year at an alarming rate. Well, I want to help fix that. So please consider this a personal invitation to join me each week on my mission to get you traveling more than ever before. Because while the world is a pretty big place to explore, your next vacation is waiting to be discovered not just around the globe, but perhaps just around the corner. Let me introduce you to the places, people, and secrets I've discovered that remind me just how exciting it is to be alive and hopefully will inspire you to get out of the house and into your next great adventure. I am Eric the Travel Guy, and this is Beyond Your Backyard. Thank you for watching and welcome to Virginia. You know, Colonial Williamsburg is part of the historic triangle, which includes Jamestown and Yorktown. But on this episode, we are laser focused on this 30 acre historic area. And it's gonna be a great episode because we're gonna learn how and why this very spot has been preserved for well over 200 years. We'll also talk with nation builders and hear firsthand from those who shaped our democracy. But we'll also hear the stories you may not be familiar with. We're talking about remarkable women and heroic slaves who worked side by side with farmers and Native Americans. Yes, we will go on and off the beaten path here and talk about the benefits of buying a ticket. And finally, we will learn how to make those delicious gingerbread biscuits. Let's get started. So here's the Commonwealth of Virginia, and here's that historic triangle located halfway between Richmond and Norfolk, which means it's easy to get to by air, rail, or car. Within the historic triangle is Colonial Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown. Family-friendly resorts, theme parks, a multitude of restaurants, and that famous Virginia wine are just a few of the reasons thousands of people from all over the world entrust this location for the vacation of a lifetime. But our focus today is on the historic area of Colonial Williamsburg, which has been funded privately since the 1920s. CW, for short, is a historical interpretation of colonial life. It's been often referred to as the world's largest living history museum, and when you visit, you'll see why that moniker is appropriate. Presidents Beth Kelly and Peter Siebert explain why this destination within this very historic triangle is unique. This is a 24 hour a day, 365 day operation. How do you do it? And the historic area in our realm has about 700 interpreters working in it. And this is everything from actors to tradesmen to site interpreters to people in groups. There's the part about what Colonial Williamsburg is in terms of a, a living 18th century, you know, urban community. But it's also, too, one of the world's biggest living history museums with all the pieces that are there to bring the city alive to people, to give the people that sense of, of place and time um, to, so they can come into touch with as close as they can with the 18th century. How do you walk this line between a presented authenticity versus authenticity? We try to meet the guests at where they are and you can get almost any kind of engagement that you want or level of authenticity that you want while you're visiting with us. Um, mm -hmm. It's always going to have the core authenticity, the core scholarship, but we may sway one way or the other. Uh, in the evenings, for example, mm -hmm. we try to do a little bit more entertainment side than we do complete scholarship. Got it. For so many people who come here and they want to eat in a restaurant, they want to hear the music, they want to hear the blacksmith, they want to smell the sulfur from the coal, um, and more importantly, they want, to have it, they want to walk through that garden and run into Thomas Jefferson and discuss democracy. <laughs> That's a level of experience that this place, I think, uniquely provides. You're talking about a team here that this is not a job to them. You know, at home, they're studying on their own. They are just lovers of history. An integral part of a Colonial Williamsburg visit is an understanding by demonstration of the trades. 
You see, back in the 18th century, Williamsburg was a self-sustaining community, and that tradition continues today. Now, this is the armory, and we're making a stop at the blacksmith shop. Are people surprised at how many trades are going on here in the historic area? I think so. It's a, a, an impressive collection. We have more traditional trades here than any other historic site. We have the biggest uh, trade skill preservation program, I think, in the world. And we're talking, obviously, blacksmith, we're talking metal, we're talking leather. Help us out. What are we going to see? That's right. We've got textiles, woodworking, cloth workers, carpenters, joiners, wheelwrights, coopers, in terms of metalworking, blacksmith, silversmith, brass founders. I think it's important to note also that we didn't just make this up. This was the actual location. Help me out with the history of the site itself. One of the unique aspects of Colonial Williamsburg is it is actually an 18th century city. The streets that you walk were laid out in 1699. Uh, many of the buildings, a hundred of the buildings, date to the 18th century. And then we reconstructed the other fabric of the town which has disappeared, including this blacksmith shop. And what about the French? Uh, there was an alliance with the French that was negotiated by Benjamin Franklin, sort of a secret alliance that brought 10 French gunsmiths to this workshop during the Revolutionary War before we had an official alliance. Really? So oh, that's really cool. We had technicians coming out of the most advanced gun building centers in Europe assisting the United States and setting up the industries they're gonna need to fight the British. Yeah, certainly during wartime, that was another issue. Right. Men went right. off to the war and women learned those trades. Exactly, yeah. You, you find women uh, pressed into service, I think, all throughout history. You see men and women, people of all races here, working in these shops. We have a female that works in the blacksmith shop. Thank you, sir, very much for this. Good talking I to you. I appreciate that. In the 18th century, protecting your family and your crops, that's your livelihood. Well, that's an ongoing concern. That's why, here, Eric, that's why you need one of these guys. Look at that. But the question I have is, how do you go from this to this? Well, I'll give you a hint. A lot of hard work. Wow. I'm just gonna step out here. Whoa. Skilled tradesmen work in Colonial Williamsburg educating consumers on the business of protection. After my short visit, I decided to learn how to fire one of these marvels. Guests of Colonial Williamsburg receive a short educational safety demonstration. Then we load the gunpowder and aim at the target. I loved it. The geographic boundary of the historic area is very well defined. The question is, how do they keep the 18th century in and the 21st century out? Well, the answer is simpler than you think. Come with me. In the mid-1950s, tunnels were created to move employees and supplies to different parts of the experience. This includes the four taverns owned and operated by the foundation. And yes, having lunch or dinner at these authentic venues is a treat. Which reminds me, early in the morning, guests queue up for a fresh, hot out of the oven ginger biscuit or cookie. Barbara and I whipped up a fresh batch, put them in the oven, and then it was time to taste. Outstanding. It's interesting to note that a woman in colonial times couldn't hold a seat in government. They obviously couldn't vote either, but what did they do? What could they do? Well, they did just about everything else. And those stories are accurately portrayed every day here in Colonial Williamsburg. But what about colonial life for slaves and African Americans? That's where nation builder Stephen Sills picks up the story. He plays the role of James Armistead Lafayette, and almost every day of the week, he appears in costume as Lafayette to help show and tell the authentic African-American story in Colonial Williamsburg. Don't you feel the work you're doing, dare I say, is, is noble work? It's important work. It is. I am giving a voice to people who for so long were voiceless. I feel a great honor that every day I get to portray people who helped to build this nation, but that aren't as well known. Mm -hmm. So I get to tell people the story. I get to immerse them in the world. And if they leave here going, wow, I never knew about that. Or I finally understand this for the first time. It makes it all worth it. Mm -hmm. Is the African-American story being told well here at Colonial Williamsburg today? Oh, yes. Slavery is uncomfortable. So when you're interpreting it, it's going to be, it's difficult. You have to be honest. 
And if you're being honest, people will will see the humanity in it because that that's really what's important, not the not not the the disgusting dredges of of slave life, right. but the fact that these were people, these were mothers and daughters and sons and husbands and lovers and carpenters. They are people, and when you interpret them first as the people that they saw themselves as, and not just as slaves, it ends up humanizing it. And in, in humanizing it, it makes it, um, I don't want to say easier, but yeah. it makes it possible for people to come to it with whatever perspective they have and go, oh, I think I understand that a little better because I, I get it. It connects to me on some level. Is this subject matter that was not done very well even 50 years ago or even 30 years ago? And, and or was that part of the Colonial Williamsburg experience back then? What's really changed in the last 10 or 15 years is that now it's, it's more social. It, it's less about this person was a slave. This person owned this person. This person went to the store and did this. It's more about who were you? Mm -hmm. What was your point of view? Point of view has become so important that it's not just a story of who you are, but it's the story of, of who you saw yourself as. So it's not a story of a slave, but it's a story of James who was enslaved, who saw himself as a father at the time of three children, who had a wife, who was trying to do what he could to make the best life that he could with the circumstances that he had. And when you tell the story from that point of view, it really helps to, to make the story more robust and, and more inclusive as well. I see the story now and I, and I go, oh, I now understand that and oh, they understand my identity and where I come from because they're using a point of view that I understand. How authentic is it, and, and are you are you cognizant of the notion that people are still on vacation? Yes. You want to be careful about how authentic you get. We want to make sure that people are immersed within an 18th century experience, but we also want to be cognizant of the fact that they are on vacation and that they need certain amenities. You're going to come into a building and it's going to be air conditioned and it's going to be heated, mm -hmm. partly for conservation, but mostly because we want to make sure that the guest is comfortable. Because if you're not comfortable, you're not going to be ready to, to take in things. You're just going to be going, oh, I'm hot. <laughs> oh, where's the water? I say that all the time, no matter what. I don't know, but that's another matter. <laughs> I'm constantly me. drinking water, so I understand. <laughs> Yeah. Right, got it. Colonial Williamsburg and and all the performers and the, and the educators, they don't have to take a point of view. That's another thing that's really important. We're interpreters, we're educators, and part of interpretation is not giving your opinion. Our job is not to give you your opinion or our opinion. Our job is to give you the history within a context that allows you to make your own conclusions, to see your history unfold, and then by that have an understanding of why the people in the 18th century did what they did. So it, it's very much about the, the guest engaging us and us provoking the guests to have a thought within the context of, of what it is that we're showing them. I appreciate this. Guests have been visiting Colonial Williamsburg for generations. Today, the foundation goes to great lengths to make the visit as easy as possible. Those in the know plan their entire vacation in advance. They purchase multi-day tickets online, download the app, stay at one of the foundation-owned hotels, and start their experience at the visitor center. Using the free public transportation is also an excellent way to cut down on the walking. Buying tickets gets you inside these preserved or recreated structures such as the archaeological sites, Governor's Palace, the trade shops, and other fun, educational, and authentic experiences, including two world-class art museums. To somebody that's never been here, mm -hmm. how do you describe this experience to them? We have two museums under one roof. We have the DeWitt Wallace Decorative Arts Museum, and that is a museum full of furnishings, house furnishings, the type of things that you would have lived with in the 18th century. We also have the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Folk Art Museum. We're the oldest continuously operating museum that focuses on American folk art and the education of it. How many galleries are we 
talking about here? Probably about two dozen, a little more. Yeah. Um, and there's stuff for everyone to see. I mean, we have children's galleries that are full of toys like dollhouses and soldiers and playing mm -hmm. blocks. Galleries that are devoted to more serious topics if you're a collector. So we have furniture galleries, textile galleries. We try to change our exhibitions all the time so it's something fresh and new. We have about 70,000 objects in the collection and we try very hard to keep those things rotating. You stop and look at any one particular object, there's a story behind that object. And that's a piece mm -hmm. of history and a piece of art from this country that's, that's really almost takes your breath away, wouldn't you say? We have the ability to study objects in their original context. So we have the ability to tell stories, not only about the art form itself, but also how it was used historically, culturally, socially. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to say, that's the hard part. <laughs> right. yeah. How does the museum fit into the rest of the Colonial Williamsburg experience? We are a companion to the historic area. We try very hard to create exhibits that complement some of the programming. We have a show right now that uses some of the architectural elements that came from buildings in the historic area. We have a really wonderful video that shows the town from the 1930s mm -hmm. and today. We try to make sure there's a connection between both. 2017, you broke ground. Right. But this is a pretty big expansion, 50,000 square feet, yeah, yeah. Uh, $40 million, two years. What are you going to do there? We'll get new exhibition space, new introductory galleries that help um, to better explain what it is you're looking at and introduce mm -hmm. the various disciplines and collections. So there's a, there's a lot. Great. Thank you for this. Thanks, thanks for coming. I think at this point it's worth noting that the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation doesn't receive government funding, which means the dollars you spend here go to conservation and preservation in labs just like this one so that Colonial Williamsburg can continue to tell the enduring story of America. As a guest, you can take a behind the scenes tour of the conservation labs. From textiles to artifacts to art, a tour here will demonstrate the monumental and important work that stretches well beyond just another fun place to vacation. Which brings us back to nation builders. Names such as George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson were all here in Williamsburg in the late 18th century. Bill Barker is the gold standard of those talented performers slash educators. He spoke with us in character as President Thomas Jefferson. The American story that we are telling, that here we are today, what's gonna happen in the future? What do you think is going to happen to this young nation? I think that no longer with royalty, monarchy, nobility, landed gentry, aristocracy standing at the helm of our ship of state, the fact that it is now the people, the American people that stand at the helm, we realize we sail through uncharted waters. Man has never been here before. Mm -hmm. That which will guide our rudder better than anything else as we face the storms at sea for rescue assured, they are as natural in the political world as they are in the, temp the tempest, as the same in the physical, will be our history. Mm -hmm. Our history will guide us forward. So long as we're mindful of our history to remember where we've been, we will better understand where we are. And therefore, I think the American people will place hope at the bow with fear well astern and meet our future boldly and realize that as a child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40, our laws and institutions grow as we grow as a people, that we become the more American every day. Mm -hmm. and, and I think our history will be our best guide. That is why to return to Williamsburg, where else, what, where better, in order to reflect upon our history. You spent, was it 20 to 25 years here, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I, I first came here as a young man, 17 years of age, mm -hmm. uh, to attend the Old Royal College of William and Mary. Mm -hmm. And I would have never thought that 20 years later, at 37, I would be the resident of the governor's palace, the second elected governor of the Commonwealth. I would be the one to find it necessary as governor to remove our capital from this high ground between the James River to the south, the York River to the north, that we'd be better protected during the war mm -hmm. on the heights of Richmond. Mm -hmm. I was well prepared when I became governor because of that education I received as a young man here. Yeah. 
because of my teacher, Dr. William Small, of whom I have written and profited in confabulation as we are doing now, mm -hmm. had gentlemanly, correct manners, and enlarged mind, and a happy talent for communication. It was Dr. Small, perhaps more than any other, who fixed my destinies. And that's why I've always believed, particularly as we wonder what the future will be like, we must place education always at the forefront and remain an educated citizen body. That, more than anything else, will help to steer us forward as an enlightened people and a people aware and mindful of their responsibility. I'm really glad you mentioned that because if we want to understand the course that we want to set for the future, isn't it a pretty good idea to understand where we came from? And isn't Colonial Williamsburg one of those places that's, well, un certainly unmatched in the world, and, and that is a living history museum, if you don't mind me using the word. No, no, the past is always prologue. It is our past that is no se so necessary to remind us uh, that we have ever been living and breathing, that the past was not less intelligent than we are today. Mm -hmm. They simply had not made that further discovery of how to improve their lives, uh, how to be more bold, to take a step forward. Yes, we may retract, fall back, but ever to move forward for the improvement of the condition of man. What do you think your biggest contribution to the American story will be? I will hope that history will be kind and enlightened to consider that I was able to give to the American people their inherent right to be who they are, founded upon the history of who we were. By that I mean simply, as author of the Declaration of American Independence, there's nothing new or original within it. Mm -hmm. Everything has been written, argued, debated before. You may find it in the elementary books of public right, the works of Aristotle, Cicero, Algernon, Sidney, John Locke, those authors, their works that you have read, that, uh, that all Americans have read. Well, no, sir. <laughs> no, mindful that in 1776, many Americans could not even read. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do, my challenge, were, was to shed the lofty sophisms of these ancient authors, explain it in clear and simple terms. Yes, but Mr. President, all your S's look like F's. <laughs> what's, what's with that? This is one of the reasons why in time when I spell my name, J-E-F-F-E-R-S-O-N, I used to make the F's somewhat as it might be perceived. S's, so I had now put a line through it so people would realize, no, Jefferson's no longer old-fashioned. It's not Jefferson, right. it's Jefferson with the S. <laughs> you are correct, sir. Well, and what about this fellow? And I, I'm hesitant to bring it up because I know it's rather controversial. Uh, his name is Bill Barker. Are you familiar with this man? I dare say that this has been a most pleasant confabulation until you brought up the name of that scallywag, that vagabond. He makes a livelihood out of imitating me. I can hardly go anywhere without him following me. You know, they say that mimicry is flattery. Yeah, it's true. Um, but not by this scallywag. Oh, I can't imagine. Fantastic. And the home, are you, gonna fin are you ever going to finish your home? I mean, you keep working on Monticello. Is it ever going to actually be finished? I, thank you for that. You must come visit to see. I enjoy two much putting up and then I pull it down. Well, I try to get everything over early in the morning. You know the sun has never caught me in bed. I rise before the sun. I get all of my administrations together. I write all my letters on the average 10 to 12 a day, even for breakfast. And I dine sparingly. One never complains for having eaten too little. And then once I get the administration away, once I tend to my duties, I have the rest of the day to enjoy and to manufacture as I choose. Before we go, what do people not know about you? Firstly, that, uh, that I enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Not a blade of grass grows uninteresting to me. Mm -hmm. I have a great faith and a great trust in mankind. And that faith and that trust in my fellow man is what, uh, is what encourages me each day to rise with a smile upon my face and a hope for the future. I would say as well that, um, that I always look at sentiment as a guiding element in life. I've always had a dialogue throughout my life between my head and my heart. I should assure you this, I would lament that an individual would not want to follow their heart, to follow their head, surely, for reason, to help us understand that error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it, but the heart is rarely wrong. Mm -hmm. And therefore, with a, with a sober mind and an astute intellect, I think you can help guide the heart. Now, Third, that is reserved. 
mm -hmm. is what I should not tell you. Every <laughs> individual ought to reserve their privacy. And in our nation, uh, we can do that. We can be protected and defended in our innermost uh, uh, concerns and interests and affections of the heart. Well, with my heart, I say, I have loved speaking with you, and thank you for taking the time. My pleasure as well. So I think now you're getting the full picture. This is showing and telling the story of American democracy. So come and see for yourself why Colonial Williamsburg has earned its prestigious place in American history. I'm Eric the Travel Guy. Thank you for exploring Beyond Your Backyard. Welcome to the Abbey Aldridge Rockefeller Today, we're in Colonial Williamsburg. <laughs> good evening. I think this is code for, Eric, you're not very good at this. I laughed, I cried, better than cats. Soup. Soup. Like a pro.